Thank you. Good morning. That was a very, very nice, very flattering introduction. I appreciate it very much. It's my pleasure to be here with you this morning. I have to uh, apologize in advance. I'm not feeling very well, uh, either allergies and or a cold. Uh, my wife reminds me that with climate change, everything is up for grabs. And in the uh, D.C. area, everyone that has allergies is clearly uh, and very keenly aware of them this season. So my apologies in advance. Um, I, I want to start, uh, before I get into my remarks, by paying tribute to Jack O'Dell, who's here. Um, Jack is, uh, is my hero, and he's my mentor, and uh, I absolutely love him. And I'm truly honored that he's, uh, he's here with us today. I, um, I keep getting asked when I'm traveling by people more or less the same question. Uh, I was actually walking down a street the other day in D.C. after a reception, and this, uh, this guy who had been in the same reception was talking with me, found out I was a trade unionist, and, and he said, Bill, this is what I don't understand. Um, workers are getting their asses kicked around the United States. We have a polarization of wealth greater than any time since 1929. Um, and why are workers not in masses of numbers joining unions? Why are they not resisting in the way that one would expect, even though there is resistance? And this is a question that everyone has been grappling with. And there's a variety of different answers. And before I get into what I think we have to do in the union movement, I want to just go back a few decades in order to situate why and how it is that we're in the situation that we're in. Um, it actually goes back to 1964. In the aftermath of Goldwater's defeat, there was a segment of the extreme right wing that did a very, very interesting assessment, the kind of assessment that we on the left should do. They looked at the situation and trying to figure out why and how they got defeated in the way that they did and what to do about it. And they began uh, a certain amount of theorizing uh, around the situation and developing strategy. Richard Vigory, for example, was one of the key people at that moment. And they started watching trends. They paid attention to something that Lyndon Johnson said, which is when he signed the 64 Civil Rights Act, saying that the Democrats had lost the South at least for a couple of generations. And Vigory and others realized that something was changing, and the question was, what could they do about it? And then emerged Wallace's campaign. And Wallace's campaign was very, very interesting in, in several ways. One was that he introduced the use of very good coded language uh, in order to express uh, a very openly racist and right-wing orientation. But the other thing about Wallace's campaign was not so much its impact on the South, but its impact on the North. And what people like Vigory and others saw was that there was something that they could play into. There was, there was a mass movement that could be generated that they could take advantage of. Now, within the what eventually becomes Nixon's campaign, Kevin Phillips develops what was called the Southern Strategy, with which I think everyone's familiar. But I think it's important to understand it wasn't the Southern Strategy, it was the white people's strategy. It was not about the South, it was about white people. And it was about reforming the Republican Party as the non-black party. And basically to articulate that the Republican Party was going to be the party representing those who they like to describe as uh, the people that were losing out as a result of the mass movements that were emerging in the 1960s. And they did a phenomenal job. Now, Vigory and others despised Nixon. 
And this is another thing that's very interesting. They basically thought that Nixon was too liberal, he was an opportunist, uh, all of these things. Uh, he was certainly an opportunist. Um, and they, they, uh, they, 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 they didn't, it didn't matter to them fundamentally because they made a strategic decision. They either would go with Wallace's independent party or with the Republicans, and they decided ultimately to go with the Republicans. Having come to the conclusion, and I think it's a, a correct conclusion, that third parties at the national level are very, very difficult to build and sustain in the United States, whether we want them or not. Very, very difficult. And that they emerge under certain very specific circumstances. So they decided a strategy of what the Trotskyists would have called entrism, right? Which was to enter into the Republican Party and to move it. They did not do a frontal assault on Nixon. Now, at the same time as, uh, as this was going on, there was the call to arms by Justice Lewis Powell. He wasn't a justice then. But the Powell Memorandum, which uh, has received a, a fair amount of attention, is really quite interesting because it's a memorandum to the Chamber of Commerce, and basically Powell is sounding the alarm. And it's sometimes hard for us to realize and to remember that the 60s was a time of excitement as well as chaos. It was a time of great possibilities. And the other side was deeply, deeply worried. Nixon, for example, thought a civil war could break out. The other side was very, very worried about what, in fact, might happen. And in that situation, Powell starts making an argument that capital needs to reassert itself very openly, or at least the or the Caligula wing of capital, and that it needs to assert itself, and that it needs to do that in a very, very direct way. So it's in that memorandum that hopefully you've read, if you haven't, please do, where he lays out things uh, that include establishing think tanks, of, of carrying out real ideological fights in the media, et cetera. But the larger piece that the right wing decided to do was to essentially engage in a three-pronged counter-assault on the progressive social movements at the level of uh, politics, political and legislative activity, mass movements, and legal action. Now, let me just start with the mass movements, because that was something that I watched in the 1970s with actually great admiration as, as to what the right wing was able to do. They basically developed and advanced a series of mass movements that were single issue, anti-abortion, anti-busing, guns, etc. And the precondition to enter into any of those mass movements was not your view on anything else, just your view on that issue. Thus, people that would be participating in that would have very contradictory views but they nevertheless were united in their opposition to whatever that particular issue was. Nevertheless, the leaders of those movements were deeply intertwined and would meet and, and strategize. But, they, but this issue of the mass movements, particularly, again, the use of coded language, the anti-busing movement, this issue of, of choice when it came to schools, alleged choice, which was really a code for attacking uh, desegregation. All of these things, the right was moving. They also moved the legal strategy. Particularly, you start to see it in the 1970s with attack after attack after attack on affirmative action. And then, of course, there was a political strategy. Now, the political strategy included uniting with people like Nixon, but the other part was paying a great deal of attention to moving struggles at the local level and building bases. Uh, and they, they did the building bases in a few different ways. One was by developing and operationalizing their candidates as much as possible under the radar in elections that many of us progressives thought at the time were not all that important. The other thing that they did and were masterful at was uh, ballot initiatives. And uh, here again, I think that there's much that we can learn from that because their ballot initiatives were often done at, at points when they knew that they would lose. So the question is, well, why did they do it? And there were actually two reasons. 
for example, the right wing would do, run a ballot initiative in California. They'd put a ballot initiative on a ballot saying uh, that California will be divided and Northern California will be all white. And at that point, progressives and liberals would go nuts and money would pour into California to stop the ballot initiative, which was precisely what the right wanted. Resources that could actually go somewhere else were going in to fight a silly ballot initiative. But the other reason for this was that the ballot initiatives were wonderful tools for building base areas within California to basically pull together people that were united around the overall uh, thrust of the right. And they started building these around the country. And while many of us either ignored electoral politics or focused exclusively at the national level, the right was churning away, particularly at the base. Um, so as a result, we now find ourselves in a situation that did not start with Reagan, which many of us in the labor movement like to do. We say it all went back. No, it didn't just start with Reagan. Reagan was the result of all of this stuff that was churning. But even with Reagan, what's interesting is that when you look at what happened in the Patco situation, and uh, there's a great book by Joe McCartan, Collision Course, which I would strongly recommend people look at about the Patco strike. What was fascinating when you look at that is that contrary to what many of us believed, Reagan at the time actually wasn't trying to destroy the union movement. Um, the PATCO leadership played into his hands by engaging in a strike where there was almost no preparation, no alliance building, et cetera. But Reagan's initial objectives were not to destroy the union movement. And even once the strike began and the more extreme elements of his cabinet took control and really pushed it, they were then, even then, not attempting to wipe us out. They were attempting to blunt us. But now we're in a qualitatively different situation. Today, we're in a situation that they call in military terms the final offensive. So the other side now is not trying to weaken us. They're not trying to blunt us. They're trying to annihilate us. And it, was, it becomes very clear when you look at what happened in Wisconsin and elsewhere. The passage of right, right to work in uh, Michigan and Wisconsin and, and the threat in a number of other places, including places like Pennsylvania, that the other side is, sees an opportunity now based on our weakness to completely take us out. Now, so I would, start, I would say that we have to understand, in order to fight back, we have to understand that we suffered a strategic defeat. We didn't suffer a tactical defeat. We just, it's not just that we've been, we, we suffered a strategic defeat. And in order to turn that around, we have to begin with that recognition. The other thing that we have to begin, uh, we have to recognize, is that we are in an asymmetric situation with our opponents. That, uh, that we are never going to have the resources that our opponents have. And I was in Albany the other day talking with people, and I, I said, you know, I'm tired of people complaining about the Koch brothers. And they say, well, the Koch brothers have zillions of dollars. Oh, oh, right? Well, there's no, one, no time in history that the oppressed ever had more resources than the oppressor. Never. Right? And, and so we just have to start there. We, have to, we just have to get over it. Right? We, have to, we have to just get over it. We're not going to have the money the Koch brothers are going to have. There is no invisible socialist country in the middle of the Atlantic that's going to ship us gold. Right? There's no uh, billionaire that's sitting around just saying, damn, I wish I could fund a revolution. It just simply doesn't work that way. So when you're in an asymmetric situation, it means your strategy has to change entirely. And the problem for the labor movement, the union movement, is that it doesn't want to accept the depth of the strategic defeat and the fact that we are in an asymmetric situation, meaning we cannot continue to fight the way that we have in the past. All right, now, um, when I think of our situation then, let me go to the other side. I, uh, I'm very much, I grew up watching films, and I, I love to use films for metaphor. 
And, and a, f a few months back, I, I, this just came to mind. Um, I don't know how many of you ever saw the film, The Flight of the Phoenix. Anyone here? All right, so you got to see it. It was remade, so that means you really have to see it. Um, the Flight of the Phoenix is about this cargo plane going across the Libyan desert. Uh, Jimmy Stewart, Ernest Borgnine, Richard Attenborough are in the original ones. Going, and they get into the sandstorm, and they crash. And they're in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Uh, Jimmy Stewart, who's the pilot, walks around, surveys the plane, and understands that the plane will never take off again. It just won't. So um, the problem then is, like, what are they going to do? On the plane is this uh, aircraft engineer. He surveys the plane. And he goes back to Jimmy Stewart and says, you know, we have the right parts on this plane to build a new one that will get us out. And everyone laughs at him at first. But the choice for the survivors was simple. They could sit under the wing of the plane in the shade of the desert sun and wait for help, which means to die slowly. They could try walking out of the desert, which would probably also mean death. Or they could build a new plane. And they ultimately build a new plane. One of the greatest, most difficult realizations for me has been, after years in the trade union movement, is that our plane crashed. It's not taking off again. It's not. The movement that brought us all to this room is stuck in the sand. Now, the good news is that the parts are there to build a new plane. And everything that we do going forward must be with the aim, whether we're trying to reform a union or build new institutions, building the Domestic Workers Association, building jobs with justice, everything must be done with an aim of the creation of that new movement. I don't know when it will come into existence. But the years and years that we've spent trying to turn around the existing trade union movement have ultimately failed, even though there have been many, many good things that have taken place. Now, how, did, how was it that we crashed? Well, there are several different factors that I think we have to look at. One was certainly Taft-Hartley. The failure to organize the South and the Southwest, largely because we did not, as a movement, wish to confront race. Not keeping up with changes in the workforce, including the massive influx of women, as well as the change in technology and what it meant for work. The lack of global solidarity. The fact that up until really 1995, when people around the world would talk about the AFL-CIO, they would also have jokingly say the AFL-CIA. It is only in the more recent past that we've really appreciated come to appreciate real global solidarity. But also lying within this is the fact that our movement has acted as a lobby rather than as a social movement. That the, that the notion that the movement should be, that trade unions should be in fact speaking up for all workers is something that was lost in the 1940s. Yes, of course we supported various kinds of legislation. And different unions did that. But at the end of the day, and you see this in opinion poll after opinion poll, where non-union workers will say, unions are good for their members, but they're not good for the rest of us. And that is the greatest condemnation that a trade union movement can ever receive. Now, the efforts at renewal, as I said, have largely failed because we've fit, we have not appreciated the change or the, the, the moment that we're in. We've, we, we continue to act under the assumption, and you see this in the upper echelons of most unions, we continue to act under the assumption that global capitalism, at the end of the day, would really like a partnership with us, or can be convinced or cajoled into some sort of partnership with us. And that flies in the face of reality. See, it's not simply that the Republicans are attempting to annihilate the union movement. You look around the world and you understand the tendencies in global capitalism, and the aim is to weaken and destroy all forms of worker organization. The thinking that went into the idea of partnerships 
which was based on the struggles that were going on in the 20s and 30s and 40s, that notion is gone. It is gone. It is not coming back. They're not interested in a partnership. Well, sure, there might be certain companies that are, but I'm talking about global capital as a whole. Yet, our movement continues to beg for partnerships, to beg for capital to turn around, for beg for, to, to beg for, for capital to appreciate the role that we can play, rather than understanding that fundamentally what our role has to be is to be speaking up for the millions and millions of workers there that are on a daily basis being crushed by the juggernaut of capital. Now, as I mentioned before, 2011 signaled the final offensive. And um, the failure of the union movement to present itself as a representative of the working class has resulted in openings for some very nefarious forces and particularly, I want to emphasize the issue of right-wing populism. Now, time doesn't permit me to go into an exhaustive analysis of this in part because I want to bring this in for a landing and engage in a discussion with you. But let me just say that the issue of right-wing populism is something that our movement really doesn't seem to like to talk about. Um, right-wing populism is not right-wing plus populism. Right-wing populism is a unitary phenomenon. It is a phenomenon, it is, it is a movement against the future. It is a movement that plays on fears and suspicions. It is fundamentally an irrationalist movement. Within right-wing populism, there's fascism as one current, but there are other currents that exist within right-wing populism. And right-wing populism, as I love to say, is the herpes of capitalism. It is, the, it, is the, it is the virus that exists within capitalism and it surfaces with all manifestations when the larger body is weakened. For example, during economic crises. And during economic crises, and particularly during financial crises, you see certain manifestations of right-wing populism, particularly anti-Semitism. Right-wing populism is extremely dangerous. One of the reasons it's dangerous is that many of its, its co it, it uses codes and rhetoric that sometimes sounds like it's coming from the left. And this confuses many people. You know, when you'll hear various right-wing populists, uh, you know, whether it's Ron Paul or others that will speak out against uh, a foreign intervention, or they might speak out against a particular, something a particular company does. But we have to understand that right-wing populism is rooted fundamentally in that irrationalism and a very, very deep nativism. That is a belief that there is a legitimate and illegitimate population within the borders of the United States. Right-wing populism exists as a current, a very, a very important current within the working class, and including within our own unions. Yet, unions are almost afraid to talk about it. Because see, in order to address right-wing populism, you have to at some point talk about race. And we have a movement that is, is trapped in a myth. And the myth is that if we talk about race, we'll divide ourselves, rather than recognizing that we're already divided, and therefore we have to figure out how best to unite. So right-wing populism is, I would argue, the main force that we have to fight within the working class if we are to build uh, the type of movement that needs to, be, to, needs to be built. All right, so what do we do at this moment? When I look around, one of the things that I see is that there are struggles that are taking place. There are things that are bubbling up, but they're not cascading. And, and for example, in, in 2008, early 2009, the Republic windows and doors struggle, where the workers seized the, the factory. At the end of that struggle, a lot of people said, OK, that's it. Now workers are going to seize factories around the country. I'm still waiting, right? Um, the uh, Wisconsin uprising, massive. Madison uprising, massive, tremendous, exciting. Wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the Arab Democratic uprising. Um, it was brilliant, inspired, occupied, yet it did not cascade. Um, there are struggles that are underway 
that are very important. Sometimes they lead to victories, other times defeats. But the problem is that they're not cascading, and the deeper problem is that we expect them to cascade, as if it will happen on its own. It will not. In the absence of leadership and organization, these struggles will just bubble up. What is necessary is linking these struggles together, and that's where we deeply need issues, uh, need to talk about organization. So specifically, what does the union movement need to do? I want to identify four things. Um, strategy, internal education, creative tactics, and strategic alliances. Um, strategy, we have to be fighting for worker power industrially and geographically. So it's not simply about bargaining strategy. It's about a strategy that really is fighting for power. But in order to do that, the issue of internal education becomes really important. Now, I don't have to convince you of this, but I do have to convince many people in the rest of the movement that do not take internal education seriously. They look at internal education at best as websites, sometimes as newsletters, other times as speeches by leaders. I mean, every so often a flyer. And then, you know, if they're feeling very generous, they'll bring in a labor historian to give a talk. But they're not dealing with real education, which with adults is a, a, a dialogue that takes place, an engagement. We're not dealing with five-year-olds. We're dealing with adults. We're dealing with people who have points of view that need to be respected, irrespective of whether we agree with them. But we need to engage them. And internal education is pivotal if we are to move the movement forward. We need creative tactics. A lot of what we do is simply put, boring, uh, and also ineffective. When you have strikes where people are walking around in picket lines looking like the lost battalion and are, have no impact on shutting down production, you know we have to look for more creative tactics. And again, that's where I go back to what the right has been so brilliant at. And we need strategic alliances. We need to be thinking about who really are our friends out there? Who are the other forces in society that actually have an interest in us winning? And how do we work with them, not just for a particular battle, but thinking long term? So let me return to this issue of the flight of the Phoenix. The parts were there for a new plane. Uh, there was a need for an engineer. Those building a new plane had to accept that the alternatives to building such a plane were simply unacceptable. And finally, there was no certainty of success. But there was certainty as to what would happen if they didn't pursue that direction. So what does that finally mean for us? Um, my favorite metaphor, which I'm going to keep using, as long as I'm addressing people that haven't heard it before, uh, comes from the HBO series Band of Brothers, about 101st Airborne Division. Uh, how many of you have seen that? OK. Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, one of the most brilliant uh, war films I've ever seen. Uh, so realistic that when the bullets are flying, I was ducking. Um, in the second or third episode, their replacements are coming to the front. And they are, um, they encounter a veteran of the Normandy invasion. And he says to them, you're scared, aren't you? And they said, yes. And he said, that's because you don't realize you're already dead. And he said, as long as you think you're alive, you're not going to be able to fight the Germans. The moment you realize that you're dead, you'll be able to fight them. Now, when I first heard that, I said, wow, that's like pretty heavy. You know, is this like a kamikaze argument or something? And no, it was, it, was, it was actually very simple. When you are primarily thinking about self-preservation, you cannot take the other side out because you're always ducking. The moment that you realize that you have no alternative, you have nothing else to lose, that is actually when you can take the other side down. Right? We have to realize we have to take that same approach. Instead of the main preoccupation being, we've got to make sure we have enough money to keep the international headquarters open. We've got to make sure that we have enough money to keep the pension fund for the staff and leaders going. 
right? That we have to make sure that we don't lose the next election because you know, many members want us to file more grievances. Until we realize that all of that is pointless, that it doesn't matter how many grievances we file or arbitrations we handle, none of that is gonna stop John Boehner. None of that is gonna stop Mitch McConnell. None of that is gonna stop the Koch brothers. Until we realize that, we're toast. The moment that we realize that we're already dead, we have a chance of kicking the ass of the other side and taking them down. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.